Well, good morning again. Today we are wrapping up our little mini catechesis class that we've been having. We've been in this series, Confirmation for Everyone, uh, the last month, looking at sort of some of the distinctives of our faith, what it is we believe. Uh, and this morning we're going to talk about what discipleship means, about what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so let's begin by looking at the story where Jesus actually calls his first disciples to follow him. And so hear the word of the Lord, friends, from Matthew 4, 18 through 22. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think this is kind of a wild story. Jesus walks by a bunch of fishermen, and he calls out to some of them, and he says, hey, come with me right now. I'm going to teach you how to fish for people. And they just drop everything, and immediately they go. They leave their nets. They leave their boats. James and John even leave their dad. <laughs> they drop everything, and they go to follow Jesus. And, and if you find that kind of remarkable, kind of surprising, you are not alone. Scholars have long wondered about this. I mean, why would they just drop everything and go? Some scholars have guessed that Jesus had already become pretty well-known, almost like celebrity-like by this point. And, and so by the time he shows up at the lakefront that day, James and John, Andrew and Peter, they've heard about this guy. And so when he shows up and says, hey, come follow me, they're like, yes, absolutely, we'll go. <laughs> Some scholars think that um, it, it wasn't that at all, that actually, as Matthew is writing his gospel, you know, this is on the other side of the crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus is already well known. And so the reader who's reading this gospel, he doesn't need an explanation. She doesn't need to know why these people would drop everything and follow Jesus. Everyone already understood that. There was a whole movement of people following Jesus as the Messiah. So why explain the backstory? No need. But then some guess that the reason that these people drop everything and go, drop their livelihood, all their supplies, the catch of the day, is because being called to be a disciple of a rabbi was a very, very high honor at this time. Normally, only the best of the best of the best would ever be selected to be a rabbi, and that that would only happen after you had prepared your whole life as a child and adolescent to then apply to a rabbi to be their disciple. And, and so when Jesus shows up to a bunch of fishermen, and says, hey, come and follow me, be my disciple, that they don't think twice about following him. Of course they're going to follow him. This is a high honor to be chosen to follow a rabbi. Yet no matter what their real motives were, we don't really know, it sure seems to suggest that there is something so incredibly compelling about Jesus that these people would just right, right at the drop of a hat leave everything to follow him leave everything to become his disciple. You know, when we think of the word disciple, I think we tend to equate it with our word for student. Um, I, I think that's what happens. Someone who wants to learn from a teacher. And so a good student's goal would be to know what their teacher knows. To know what their teacher knows. And so in church, we often, when we're talking about being a disciple or discipleship, I think that most folks basically assume this means like Christian education. Like that we're talking about learning a lot of information about God. We're talking about a lot of Bible study. We're talking about uh, classes to know what it is to be a Christian. But being a disciple of Jesus Christ, it goes way beyond being a student. It's about more than just knowing what our teacher knows. It's about being able to do what our teacher does, and that is different, which is why Jesus calls these guys. He says, come with me and actually follow me around. 
Because being a disciple at this time, it meant quite literally following around your rabbi, going wherever they go for years and years. Until, yes, you would know what your teacher knows, but you would also be able to do what your teacher does. There's a lovely ancient Jewish blessing that people would speak over a new young disciple. They would say, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Isn't that lovely? May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. It meant that a rabbi's disciples, they should follow behind them so closely that they would be caked in the dust that the rabbi would necessarily kick up as they walked around these dusty ancient streets. Discipleship, it's about following and following closely. How many of you guys have younger siblings? I think this might help us understand this a little bit. Younger siblings? I am the oldest, um, and my little sister Jessica is three years younger than me. And and for many years as small children, uh, she drove me absolutely bonkers. Uh, because she copied everything I did, and she went everywhere I went. Um, I I mean, she tried to dress like me. She pretended to talk like me, to walk like me. Whatever my favorite things were were suddenly her favorite things. My favorite color was her favorite color. My favorite ice cream, obviously her favorite ice cream. If I wanted to ride my bike, oh, Jessica was going to ride her bike too. Oh, it was so, so, so frustrating. (laughs) Anybody else have a little sibling that did this to them? Oh, good, a few of you. You know my torment. My parents used to remind me that copying someone is really the highest form of flattery. But at 13 years old, I just wanted a little bit of space. (laughs) I did. Anyway, one um, summer, I decided that I was going to cut off all of my hair. And so, of course, Jessica decided to do the same. Um, But the joke ended up being on her because this is the worst haircut we ever received. It's pretty good. (laughs) Look at that feathered bang, you guys. Yeah, don't even get me started on the teddy bear sweatsuit. I don't know. The 80s were a real blessing. That's all I have to say. But when we are talking about being a disciple... It's this kind of fervency and desire to follow someone around that we're getting at. Discipleship, it's never just about what we intellectually understand or believe or know about God. It's not. We can affirm that God is good, that God created and sustains and redeems the whole world. All of that is well and good. But being a disciple means something more than that. Because a disciple believes all the things, but then actually drops their nets and follows Jesus wherever he leads. A disciple says, if my teacher says to love other people, well, then I'm going to love other people. If a disciple hears his rabbi say, give your money to the poor, well, then they're going to go empty their savings account. If a disciple observes their teacher suffer for the sake of another, well, then that disciple is going to go and do the same. If a disciple says, if my teacher cuts their hair, I'm going to cut mine. And it's precisely right here that we feel the rub, I think. This is where the rubber meets the road, friends. Because sometimes following Jesus is very difficult. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes the things that Christ expects we will do, they lead us into direct confrontation with the ways of our culture, with maybe even our family values. Being a disciple is not something that we can just like add on to our life as a supplemental, like a little salad dressing on the side. No. Jesus asks for our total allegiance In fact, Jesus asks for our very lives. After several years of being Jesus' disciple, Peter and Andrew and James and John, they've seen some things. They've experienced this sort of following around discipleship for a while now. They've watched their rabbi teach and heal, and then they've been expected to do the same. They've learned a ton, and they've also practiced a ton. 
Over three years, they've been following Jesus around, and they are absolutely covered in the dust of their rabbi. But things begin to shift as Jesus prepares to head to the cross, to head to his death and what will eventually be his resurrection. And so by the time we get to the end of Matthew's gospel, being a disciple, ooh, it comes with some pretty high stakes for these former fishermen. In Matthew 16, here's what we're told. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then Jesus told his disciples, if any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? Jesus basically tells his disciples, it's about to get really tough, guys. I'm heading to the cross. I'm heading to my death. And to my resurrection, surely. But it's going to be hard. And, and Peter, he will have none of it. Peter is my favorite disciple because he is the mouthiest disciple. He will just say all the things that we are actually thinking. Thank God for it. And so he comes up to Jesus and says, no way, absolutely not. We're not doing that. Death cannot be part of this thing. And Jesus rebukes him harshly. He tells him, you're missing it. Your perspective is way off here. You're focused on what the world tells you is right. But God is doing something else. God doesn't see things the way the world sees things. And so he says, death and resurrection is where I'm going. And if you want to be my disciple, then death and resurrection, it's where you're going to. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. It is quite an invitation, to be sure. Come and die. But I really want to be clear about this this morning. This is still the invitation. This is still the invitation for you and me. To be a disciple, we are still invited to come and die. Die to your false, broken, sinful self. Die to all the dreams you have that don't align with the dreams God has for you. Die to selfishness. Die to greed to vanity, to power. Die to all the things that keep you from loving God and loving others and loving yourself well. Being a disciple will always, always involve giving up your life. It will always involve surrendering your way to the way of Christ. It might not be easy, friends. It's not. But it is a promise that comes with resurrection on the other side. Come and die and find real and lasting life. Come and die and actually discover who you really are. Come and die and find the promise of eternal life with God. Find freedom. Find wholeness. Find forgiveness from whatever it is you've done. Find healing from all that is broken. And, and you know, there really has to be something to it, this invitation. Because we're all sitting here. People have been taking Jesus up on his invitation to be a disciple a long, long time. Anybody remember the Jesus movement? Anybody remember the Jesus movement? Some crazy hippies for sure do. These are your people. 
Uh, for those too young to know, the Jesus movement, it happened in the 1960s, 70s. It was sort of a countercultural faith revival movement. It started on the West Coast with a bunch of young people. A, a little movie a few years ago, The Jesus Revolution, came out all about it. Um, but as this revival of Christian faith sort of swept across the nation, people started calling the followers of this Jesus movement Jesus people, or if they wanted to offend them, Jesus freaks. You guys heard that term? Jesus freaks. A and it's because these Jesus people, they wanted to actually return to the first century church. They thought that the church should operate like the book of Acts. They thought that people should actually follow Jesus' commands, no matter what they were, no matter if they were difficult. And so even though it was intended as an insult to call them Jesus freaks, these people loved and embraced the term. They were a group of people that wanted to do what Jesus said to do no matter how hard it was. And so if that made them Jesus freaks, well then so be it. Several decades later, in the late 90s, early 2000s, a similar group of Christians began to be compared to these Jesus freaks. They called themselves the Red Letter Christians. Red Letter Christians. Um, probably in many of your Bibles, the words of Jesus are printed in red letters. And so that's what it referred to, the words of Christ in the New Testament. But these people were known for doing exactly what Jesus said to do following the red letters of the Bible, no matter how hard it was, no matter if it was in direct confrontation to the culturally determined values of our society, even when it made other religious folks really uncomfortable. I was studying to be a minister back then, and I remember when some of these pastors and thinkers and social justice advocates, they began writing books and speaking all over the country, and I remember reading a couple of these books and, and regularly having to put them down and walk away for a little bit to like process sort of the call that they were putting out to Christians. Because a lot of the things they were, they were doing with their lives, like living quite literally directly in responsive obedience to the words of Christ, made me uncomfortable. Confronted my own cultural assumptions, my own deeply held values. Pushed me to the end of my comfort zone. But here is the thing, following Jesus will do that to you, <laughs> it really will. I am telling you right now that being a disciple of Jesus, it will lead you to places you never could have imagined going. It, you will end up doing things you didn't think you were capable of. You might end up in relationships of compassion and service and friendship with folks that you never could have imagined knowing, much less loving. This is a promise you can take to the bank. Discipleship, it's like actual following Jesus around, it will upend your life but it will upend your life in the most bizarre and beautiful ways. It will lead you to the cross. There will be some death and resurrection involved, I promise you. But in the end, do you know who you'll end up resembling? Your rabbi. Your teacher. You won't just know what your rabbi knows. You'll be able to do what your rabbi does. You know, one of the things that feels especially important to me as your pastor is making sure I'm very upfront about the call of Christ on our lives. I don't ever want to sugarcoat this whole discipleship thing. I don't. I'm not at all interested in this church being packed on Sundays with people who think like Jesus is a neato guy and they like want to come in for a little pep talk each week. I I'm not interested in that at all. In fact, I think that's pretty gross. I do. I think it's an absolute shame that more and more churches feel like just one more place in society that's designed to cater to the demands of the marketplace, <laughs> that's designed to make us feel good as current consumers. And I cannot begin to tell you the number of books and campaigns and marketing materials that are out there all promising to make our church cool, to make us desirable, promising to grow our church. 
And so hear me loud and clear. I hope we are never cool. <laughs> never. I hope we never see ourselves as marketable. I hope we're never just interested in drawing a crowd. Of course I want this place full. Of course I want people to be drawn to First Press, but I want this place full because people have encountered the love of God in Christ here. That's what matters. I want First Press to be a place where we are constantly, bravely extending the invitation to come and die. I want this place full of disciples. People that know that, oh, I found real life. Oh, I get it. That's where I'm reminded who I really am. And do you know why I feel so strongly about this? Because my rabbi does. Jesus was constantly reminding folks of the real commitment required to be a disciple. He was. I mean, there were often times that a big crowd would gather, and the very first thing he would do was start by talking about the cost of discipleship to purposely frustrate his listeners. He wanted to be really clear. We're told that he spoke in parables to confuse the, fo- the folks that had just gathered for the spectacle, the people that he knew weren't really interested. And it's not that Jesus didn't want the whole world to become his disciples. I mean, he came to redeem and save everyone, all things. That wasn't it at all. It's just that Jesus knew that the cost of discipleship, that it might be a little steep for people living in a broken world. That not everyone was going to be in. Not everybody would want to commit to this. And he wanted his disciples to know what they were getting into. After one uh, especially difficult teaching, John tells us this in his gospel. He says, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And so Jesus turned to the 12 and he asked, are you also going to leave? But Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. Again, Peter here saying (laughs) what we're all thinking. Sometimes the message is tough. Sometimes the things God calls us to, they lead us into direct confrontation with our own selfishness, our own ego, the cultural values that everyone just thinks are normal. And so do we want to leave too? My answer is always, where else would I go? It's Jesus every time for me. He has the words of life. So yeah, the invitation is to come and die. It is to deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow him wherever he leads. But we can be assured that resurrection life, the kind of life that we're actually all desperate for, that's where we're being led. That's found in relationship to Christ Jesus. And so let's be clear about this. This is a lot more about than what we think about God. It's a lot more than what we believe about God. It's about what we're actually going to do with our lives. It's whose voice we're going to listen to. It's whose way of life we're going to follow. And so may we take seriously the call to be Christ's disciple. May we follow him. May we be covered in the dust of our rabbi, friends. Amen.